So what you want to do is let lots of ideas come from anywhere. Anyone can be a strategist. Now, the senior management job is not to have the good ideas, but to spot good ones and decide what they should resource and scale up. More ideas are coming from Generation Zs and younger millennials, but it's still up to the boomers and the Xers to decide where we're going. And I think that combination together is a winner. But it means that the older people have got to spend more time listening and be reverse mentored than they were in the past. I think one of the things that's been consistent and that actually plays really well to working with uh, millennials and Gen Zs uh, that we've always done from the very beginning is it's been a company based on listening, which I, I know Carl wrote a lot about in, in, in his book and, and about very flat structures where, well, you can have hierarchy in a business. You have to, you have to, you know, be able to scale a business, but being able to listen across silos, across hierarchies, uh, listen to the perspectives of people, that's, that's good for including people of different generations in the solution, engaging them. But it's also a big part of why diversity and inclusion is successful at a business is by, is by active listening and by bringing people in. What can older generations learn from millennials and Gen Z about leadership, strategy, and dealing with crisis? And how can these younger generations unlock their professional potential by taking larger roles in organizational strategy and change? On this episode of the Delve Podcast, Desotel professor Carl Moore and Lightspeed and Age of Union founder Dax De Silva discuss communication beyond traditional hierarchies, the value of reverse mentorship and receiving feedback, and what real equality, diversity, and inclusion can look like in an organization. I'm your host for this episode, Robin Fadden. In Carl Moore's new book, Generation Y, How Boomers Can Lead and Learn from Millennials and Gen Z, he posits a philosophy that is played out in real life. He writes that people over 45 with a university degree were taught a modern worldview in their education, while people under 35 with a university degree were taught a postmodern worldview. He breaks down these two worldviews and how they differ, as well as the practical implications of how to engage, manage, and learn from people included in the millennial and Generation Z generations. Delve put Carl Moore in conversation with Dax De Silva to hear about the leadership experiences of the former Lightspeed CEO, now chair of the board, who founded his business as a young person and grew with its many changes over the years. As a management professor who also interviews CEOs, Moore was, of course, game to hear De Silva's point of view on his book. But first, let's hear from Moore about why he decided to tackle this subject of generational worldviews in the first place. Well, something which is coming up increasingly in conversations with CEOs in a way that it didn't 10, 15 years ago, it has in the last five years. Now, part of that is COVID. Part of that is the Gen Zs and the younger millennials are starting to get into managerial positions. And they're clearly incredibly important to organizations that it's their young people. And it's probably about half or more of the organization. Boomers are starting to retire. So it's something where they're really important. There's a work for talent. And so this comes across increasingly in conversations with CEOs and also in conversations with undergraduates. And I travel with them. So Dax and I were over in uh, Ghana in the Côte d'Ivoire about a month ago with 50 uh, undergraduates and alumni. So I'm really aware of what young people are thinking about. I have coffee with all my students in groups of three or four and talk about their careers and their lives. So it's a matter that came from the top, the CEOs discussing this as a perplexing issue, and the young people just looking at the world so differently than the older people have in years gone by. It really speaks to how your book and management research in general is able to cross lines between academia and leadership experiences and range across business sectors as well as academic disciplines. I mean, I know postmodern theory from literature and communication studies, for example. So speaking of bringing another type of experience into this conversation, I'd like to ask Dax first about what generation he considers himself to be a part of. I'm very much Generation X. Right. So Carl's book is speaking to you as a leader, and one could argue that Gen X kind of has a foot in both the boomer and millennial worlds. How has your generational experience in society and being in leadership positions affected your approach to running an organization, whether that's a large company or a nonprofit? If I think back to the early days of Lightspeed, you know, circa 2005, I was 28. I think that at the time, we were excited to see just what we could do with the company. Like, what, how big could we make it? How, how, uh, how many countries we could sell into? Today, we talk a lot more about Lightspeed, about what we do for the community, what the meaning of what we do is. And we, that's always been there. 
you know, Lightspeed powers the the local businesses, the the local retailer, locally owned retailer, locally owned restaurant uh, that puts money back into the community. It's investing in you know those local sustainable businesses, and so that that resonates a lot more with employees than let's just build the biggest company and let's see if we can take it public. Let's see, it's it's less about our success and more about the greater good that we're doing for society. So that shifted in terms of like how we think about the business, how we talk about the business, and why people join the business. Of course, they're looking to join a rocket ship. Everybody wants to be a part of something that's that's an exciting ride, but they also want to know that they're contributing through their work to a better world. That's been a, a big shift. I think one of the things that's been consistent and that actually w- plays really well to working with uh, millennials and Gen Zs uh, that we've always done from the very beginning is it's been a company based on listening, which I, I know Carl wrote a lot about in, in, in his book and, and about very flat structures where, well, you can have hierarchy in a business. You have to, you have to, you know, be able to scale a business, but being able to listen across silos, across hierarchies, uh, listen to the perspectives of people that's, that's good for including people of different generations in the solution, engaging them. But it's also a big part of why diversity and inclusion is successful at a business is by, is by active listening and by bringing people in. And so that's the thing that we've always done well, and I think has made us successful with these new generations. It sounds like you've been living Carl's book long before he put these ideas to paper. It resonated with me because it, it, it's very, you know, that's the reality. And it's, there's so much to celebrate in these new generations. It's very, they're very talented. And I think that there's, there's an adaptation that needs to happen from that, as, as Carl writes, the, that, you know, the modern way of, of managing to something that, that truly gets the best out of these generations and helps them reach their potential within your within your organization. And Carl, how does your discussion of these different generations and their modern and postmodern worldviews fit into your broader management research trajectory and into your previous insights on strategic management? Things I've been thinking about in my, you know, 25, 30 year career, PhD and uh, prof at, at Oxford now at McGill for about 20 years or so, is rethinking old perspectives that no longer hold. It's something that I think is important for a lot of professors to do. It's one of the things that academics do in our better moments. This book came from reading about postmodern, modern thought, kind of philosophy, but realized that it's around things like truth and knowledge. Who has truth? Who has knowledge? What is truth? Kind of philosophical issues, but had very practical implications for leaders. So that's where it came from, is one challenging kind of the views of the day, as well as uh, thinking philosophically about how the world is viewed by ourselves and how we think differently. I, I do that. I, I do a biweekly column for the Globe and Mail with an Indigenous colleague where we look at Indigenous leaders and say, actually, there's some great leaders there and they have things to teach us in today's world. Also uh, writing a book about introverts, ambiverts, and extroverts, the traditional view that all leaders are extroverts. And in fact, my research suggests probably of senior leaders, about 40% are introverts, 40% are extroverts, about 20% are ambiverts. So part of my career has been just challenging the views of the day and rethinking it a bit. Workplaces are typically multi-generational, perhaps now more than ever since people are putting off retirement. How are millennials and Gen Z changing ideas about how to manage people in a business or another organizational setting? How are they changing how management looks on an everyday scale? Well, partly it's uh, to the DAX point that they're looking for purpose, they're looking for social impact, they're looking for what are you doing about EDI. So that pressure from the front line of the organization is there, and it may surprise some of the older people, but say, Levy, you're going to get with the program. So that's one element that they're changing what we're looking for, and it's no longer just about share price, it's about stakeholder value, and that's not just empty at rhetoric. I hear it from more and more CEOs and I see actions where it's actually occurring. I think part of it is when we think about strategy, there's two big schools of strategy. One is uh, Michael Porter at Harvard and then my colleague Henry Mintzberg here at McGill. So emergent versus deliberate strategy. Michael's approach is more top down and the CEO, the C-suite, maybe with McKinsey or BCG is going to make the decisions and look the way forward. And that works still sometimes, but increasingly from talking to CEOs about how they do strategy, the emergent approach is saying we got to listen to the frontline troops, the people that are in the turbulent environment. Because if, you, if you're in a company that's in a turbulent environment, you've got to adjust how you organize and what you do more rapidly than in the past. That means the frontline troops, people with one foot inside the business and one foot in the turbulent environment, have got to be listened to. 
So what you want to do is let lots of ideas come from anywhere. Anyone can be a strategist. Now, the senior management job is not to have the good ideas, but to spot good ones and decide what they should resource and scale up. So senior management has a very important role. We hold them responsible. They have the experience and the position, hopefully, to do this. And I think they generally do. But it's more ideas are coming from Generation Zs and younger millennials. But it's still up to the boomers and the Xers to decide where we're going. And I think that combination together is a winner. But it means that the older people have got to spend more time listening and be reverse mentored than they were in the past. So it's a change that's occurred over the last 10 to 15 years in my experience. I think what I would add to that is that the, the greatest outcome that you can have from the listening that Carl is talking about is that distributed sense of shared ownership. You know, if everybody feels like they were listened to and that they're owners of, of, of the strategy, they're owners of the organization's direction, then even if a leader makes a different decision, but people feel like they were heard and people feel like even if they, they were disagreed with in the ultimate decision, that they were communicated to about, about why the decision was taken and that all of these options were weighed, then I think you have an organization that is not complaining about what, what senior management's doing, but everybody is aligned and everybody's working together for the greater success, no matter what the decision is. And so I think that there's ways to bring together an organization through some of these techniques and really leverage the way that these hierarchical but non-hierarchically strategized organizations organizations are, are being built now. One of those techniques would be managing upward, and another would be reverse mentoring, both of which Carl writes about. Could both of you talk about the phenomenon of managing upward and your experience of it? Is it something that should be more embedded within an organization? Well, in my long career, I've always had a boss. I still have a boss now. And I manage upward in the nicest possible way. And I, I, I don't think they could, hopefully they won't take umbrage at that idea. But I would be sending them information, making the request so that I recognize they have authority and they have relationships, they have resources that I want to tap into. So I'm going to spend time thinking about how do I approach them? What information do I provide? So even at my age as a boomer, I'm still managing upward. And I think I will for years to come. So it's something where it's, it's a long time process for me now, Dax has got to manage up in the sense that he's the chairman of the board. He still has the board. He still has Wall Street to worry about and customers. So I think it's an, a long-term perspective, but it's always been part of my life, period. Yeah, I, I think it's the CEO, as the founder like to, of both Lightspeed and Age of Union. I have to be conscious that, that I'm being managed upward from, from folks. And I need to allow that to happen because these folks are, are trying to help me build something better. Ultimately, I think that they have the, the organization's intentions. And so I need to understand that the community, that some of these folks that grew up in the digital age, you know, I grew up in the information age where things were being digitizing. So I'm used to that sort of, you know, wholesale change. But we're going through a, you know, a wholesale change in how people communicate, new approaches to communication. And if they're trying to bring me in on, on some of what's going to work today, then I need to be receptive to that. You know, I need to open the door to being managed upwards. People need to feel that I'm going to be aware and reflect on what they're saying and, and, and incorporate it. And that's when I think uh, you get this, this value of being an authentic leader to people, because not only are you transparent, but you are also receptive. And, uh, and it's not a waste of time for them to improve the organization by talking to you. It's interesting because on the surface, it seems like it's a sharing of power or there's a sense that power is approached differently. Of course, executive still ultimately holds the decision-making power. How does the tool of reverse mentoring come into play in a hierarchical organizational setting? When I talk to my undergrads, I say 30% of the time you're mentoring me. I have a couple of senior mentors in their 80s. It would not generally occur to them to ask my advice. Mentoring is one way is kind of traditional view of mentoring where I have um, what I call, I used to call it politically correct counsel. Now it's a woke counsel. And what I mean by woke is just showing respect for people we didn't show sufficient respect in the past. So I, I wrote an article for my Forbes blog and I sent it to uh, four or five people to just go, am I saying anything inappropriate here? Am I offending someone by saying something that an older white man might say without thought? And so what they do is they keep me more in touch with today's world and make my language better. I still fall short and make mistakes, but I'm better than I was a few years ago without tapping into young people and a sense of what's happening in today's world. But it's a back and forth that didn't, doesn't exist with the people who have mentored me for years now.
yeah, I'll give you a great example um, of you know how one thread of it has developed at Age of Union, which is my conservation alliance. So you, you have this discussion about how to engage audiences with video and so on, on on different channels. You know, there's Instagram, there's TikTok, there's others, there's YouTube. You know, of course, as I'm mentoring some of these these folks that are up and coming in our content and editorial and, and, and media themes, uh, I'm absorbing all, all of like how they were consuming media, how they're consuming news, how they're consuming the entertainment. As we've adapted and we learned from some of our earlier short documentaries and realized that we're going to need to, to do some short form formats, I've learned from them, but also as that's happened, put them in charge of coming up with what is that format going to be? And then I'm said, and then I said to them, okay, now you, you write the strategy, right? And, uh, and let's do an interactive, I'll, I'll, I'll take presentations with you and we'll develop the strategy. I'll give you your, I'll give you my feedback on it, but you're now owning the strategy. So reverse mentorship has turned into them building the strategy in, into them owning the strategy. And I'm of course, you know, instrumental in, in, in having some of the pieces come together for it. But now it's now it's less than me taking some some tidbits and and and, and turning into something and more um, giving them sort of the wings to to really really take it on and like actually the empowerment to take it on let what they know shine but beyond what they know let them experiment in whole new ways and take and test what they know and so that I think is uh, hopefully the outcome this reverse mentoring can have uh, the impact it can have on on an organization and, and just allow new innovation to happen. Yeah, it's more than lip service. It's more than a jargony term or trend. It's like you're actually creating action out of it. So I'd like to move into a question of how different generations deal with crisis today. We've had crises before the COVID-19 pandemic, but the pandemic did change the way that people work. And it shifted worker and manager expectations, especially for millennials, because millennials were reaching new career heights and Gen Z was embarking on their careers. There are different outcomes of each crisis, whether it's global or in a business, and there's something different to learn from each crisis. What can boomers, millennials, and Gen Z learn from each other about crisis situations and how to handle any new crises that might arise? You know, something where we learned a lot about management, and, and I ask CEOs, like early days of the pandemic, the first year is kind of, what did you learn from about leadership? One of the things is working from home, and today we're working two or three days a week, most people from home. And if you have small kids or you have a commute of an hour and a half each way, this totally makes sense. But part of the problem is that if you're not at work, how do I pass on culture? How do I teach you? Because we go to a meeting and afterwards I walk and say, that was great, Robin, but you might have done this. But it's you know just a short conversation. I nudge you, and you can disagree with it. But there, it's that passing on our culture and how to do our jobs well that I'm missing. So it just struck me is that we've got to rethink how do we lead, how do we teach, how do we enculturate in this new world. And from talking to a bunch of CEOs, they're thinking about this, and things are starting to emerge. But it's still somewhat early days, and work is evolving. There's usually some kind of deflation after crisis happens because you're scrambling to address the crisis and things have to be reorganized or rebuilt, whether it's done in a panic or whether it's done with slightly more planning. But we're at a point where we're talking about intergenerational responses to crisis rather than only top-down responses to crisis. How can we lean on all generations at once to address not only crises, but other workplace stresses and imbalances? We all have you know, different cultural contexts, different historical contexts. And so I think there's, there's different different types of resilience and different types of, you know, if you want to say trauma or, or different types of stresses that uh, generations have had, you know, as Carl was, uh, was, was speaking to you, there is this shift in terms of how do we balance work and life post this COVID crisis? I think that part of the discussion we had earlier about meaning and purpose also translates to how do I have meaning and purpose across my work and my, and my life? What are the balance of that? I may believe in what my company is doing. I've joined them for this purpose. But, but do I have the time uh, and the flexibility to have meaning and purpose in my own in my own life? Am I able to to, to have these things coexist? I struggle with this idea that uh, that we, we're going to have empty offices because it's so important to innovation to have people gather and to have people exchange. And so it's going to be interesting. And I've seen all the uh, the next couple of years. I've seen all the incentives that we've we've brought together with Lightspeed to have people in the office. And I was just there the other day, and and there's there's more than ever people back, and and the energy is is incredible. With Age of Union, it's very very distributed. People are doing things all over the world um, as we're as we're doing conservation, and so that's very remote. So it's going to be interesting to see the outcome of this particular crisis and how the redefinition of work, what in the long term it really improves our game. 
uh, as, a, as, a, as a work society and, and in what, and what things we may just lose, maybe for good in some industries. It'll be interesting to see how much employees continue to be listened to about their preferences or whether some companies will revert to business as usual. I mention this because we are talking about listening to younger generations who aren't yet in leadership positions. And Carl, your book offers theories and perspectives on these generations in management, but it also provides actual tools for leading and managing. Could you outline one or two of these tools, such as how to provide feedback? We talked a little bit about reverse mentoring as a tool already. Well, feedback is something where when I work at IBM, a manager spend 5% of the time when I was a manager thinking about what do I say to Dax after the meeting to mentor him, assuming he was junior. And it's something where today young people are really looking for much more feedback, probably because of video games. They get a lot of feedback. They get feedback from the educational system more. So it's something with that they get more feedback and they expect their managers to give them feedback and from my viewpoint they want to learn they want to grow but i instead of five percent of a meeting maybe 10 or 15 percent of the meeting i'm thinking what do i say to robin to dax after the meeting because they're looking to me for wisdom on how to improve and i love that attitude but i have to change and spend a bit more time thinking about it i think that this idea of having also just one mentor and i think uh, and carl touched on this really really nicely in, in, in his book there should be multiple people, you know, offering a new a new young leader in a, in an organization feedback. As I've seen some really talented uh, young people at Age of Union just come up through the ranks and and want to be seen be seen as senior. And of course, what I've seen I've seen very very senior executives at Lightspeed, and I'm like, okay, I know you're not I know you're not there yet, but you have so much the potential. But is it only my feedback alone that's going to get you there? And I realized that that uh, what Carl said in his book is very true. You, you need to have some multiple folks with different perspectives on on uh, being able to offer mentorship to, to some of these young people. And that I think gives them a different perspective because part of that mentorship is like, how do you handle Dax? You know, how, how do you how do you manage him as he's helping you grow as a as, as a leader? And so all of that that rounded perspective I think gives that person that broader support support system that they're gonna need to actually reach their full potential as a leader. Looking at leadership potential, could you both share your insights about the future of leadership that may emerge from these younger generations and the way that they, hopefully, as in Carl's book, are being managed differently today and in the near future? Well, I think one essential one is purpose. It's purpose of the organization. It's that the organization is helping people that we've neglected in the past, that's helping indigenous people, women, people of color, disabilities, and so on, where we're, we're trying to have some nobility beyond just making money. And I have this conversation in class with my undergraduates, and one or two of the undergraduates go, no, it's the, you know, the Samuelson view of the world that a purpose of business is to make money, and that's it. But I think that's a view that is not widely held by this generation, and we want to do something beyond just doing money-making stuff. And also at work, I want to be treated like a human being. I want to be respected. I want people to encourage me. I hear more and more about mental health from my neighbors and from my students. Everybody, since the pandemic, I think we wrestle these things. We just didn't talk about them as much in the past, where students are more coming to me in a way they didn't five years ago and saying, can I get a break here because I'm wrestling with something? And I think we're much more open to having real conversations and genuinely caring for people and having a bit of, in the best sense of the word, some love in the workplace of genuine concern and care for one another and caring for your neighbor beyond just seeing them as a unit of work. I'm a human being, not a human resource. And Dax, you alluded to very similar ideas. What are your insights on the future of leadership regarding not only these younger generations, but genuine empathy and humanity at work? We know we've talked a lot about meaning and purpose. One of the credos at Lightspeed is make it matter. The things that you do in your day, do they matter? And I, I think the, the next generation of leaders, if it mattered to them that all of their their daily actions, the things that they they were doing weren't weren't meaningless, didn't contribute to something better, that that, that it was always well communicated, they, that they build that ethos into um, how they design work for for the people that come to work for them, then I think the workplace is going to be full of purpose and and it will attract talent. And I think that that's the real promise of this generation as they become the next generation of leaders. Related to this conversation in a more holistic way of looking at leadership and management, and you've alluded to this already, is the question of how digital technology has affected younger generations and how it has changed work. Since Gen Z and millennials have grown up with digital technologies, 
Do you see them integrating this tech, like AI, more into the general ecology of an organization, integrating data-driven strategies and technologies into how they lead and manage rather than simply tools to get work done? I think absolutely. They love technology. They grew up with it. We even have uh, digital natives that are younger, uh, some of my youngest students just don't know a world before Google and things like that. So I think they're just going to adopt it. I just did an interview for television on only one pilot on a plane. And I said, maybe just AI flying the plane someday. And I think older people are going to be very nervous about that. I think younger people are going to be more relaxed about AI in its place. And this is an important issue where there's ethical sides to AI. But I think younger people are going to just get on with it and say, look at guys, stop fighting it, you older people. And I think that may be overstated. I'm glad we're here as a bit of a break. But it's just they're going to adopt technology very wholesalely. I, I think that there's going to be a continuous re- redefinition of how people can contribute in high value ways as technology takes takes over some of the uh, the work efforts that are going to be more and more considered low value um repetitive or just things that can be taken on by ai and and and, and other uh, other means so there will be continual re- redefinitions of work and and what it means to contribute and i think that that's been no different from the past uh, 50 years. So I think it's accelerating and it's exciting. You know, like our, our parents don't really understand our job titles and, and that continues with every generation because every new generation has job, job titles that are just completely different, uh, especially as technology accelerates. And it's going to be no different as we go from X to millennials disease to, uh, to, to alphas. It will continue to march on. Absolutely. Especially, as you said, acceleration of the technology, acceleration of what AI can do has already created different kinds of jobs, as technology has done throughout the course of history. I'd like to thank you both for your insights and for talking with me on the Delve podcast. It's been a fascinating conversation. Thanks so much. My pleasure. Our guests today on the Delve podcast were Desotel professor Carl Moore and Lightspeed and Age of Union founder Dax Da Silva, discussing how to work with different generations and how older generations can learn from younger ones to establish not only successful organizations, but organizations that uphold purpose and meaning in work, as well as equity, diversity, and inclusion principles. You can find out more about Carl Moore's book, Generation Y, on delve.mcgill.ca. Thank you for listening to the Delve podcast, produced by Delve, the thought leadership platform of the Desotel Faculty of Management at McGill University. You can follow Delve McGill on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. Subscribe to the Delve McGill podcast on your favorite podcasting app, and subscribe to Delve's email list by going to delve.mcgill.ca.